Good evening, everyone. I am Sabina Dias, Associate Professor from Saint Xavier's College, Mapsa. I am glad to introduce to you our speaker for today, Goa's seaweed queen, Gabriela De Cruz. She is a marine conservationist with a master's in biodiversity conservation and management from the University of Oxford. Gabriela is quite passionate about her work. and has worked in several projects to conserve our ecosystem she has worked in thailand with the new heaven reef conservation program where she has helped restore local reefs her most recent project is on developing a sustainable aquaculture business involving seaweeds gabriela will brief us today on various facts about seaweed and biodiversity conservation As you join in, please keep your microphones muted and the cameras turned off to avoid disturbing the speaker during the webinar. Thank you, and over to Gabriela. Thank you, Sabina, for that introduction, um, and thank you very much for having me here. Um, so I'd just like to say I am very grateful to be invited to this platform. Um, I've lived in Goa my whole life. I've I've studied abroad and then come back, and I'm hoping that whatever I've learned uh, in terms of my work abroad and my studies abroad would be really helpful in terms of building new enterprise in Goa. And I'm also really excited about being part of a growing community of people in Goa that are conscientious about the environment and are committed to doing doing something about it. I think it was quite uh, amazing to see so many people step up recently in terms of the Amche Mole campaign. Um, currently, in terms of mapping the CZMP, and also in terms of preserving a lot of our heritage structures. And um, I'm really grateful to be part of this community of people in general that are so concerned about Goa, because I think we're really lucky to live in Goa, and we're really lucky to to have the ecosystems that we have and um, the the culture that we have and i'm really excited to present to you a small part of what we could be doing to help protect goa and possibly build an interesting enterprise from this so i have worked with seaweed for the past 4 to 5 years now and this short presentation that i'm giving you is basically a run through of how i got introduced to seaweed the overall seaweed landscape in india uh, a little bit about seaweed in goa as well as looking at it from in terms of a market so if you're interested in looking at seaweed or other forms of coastal um, aquaculture such as mussels crabs etc um this might be of interest to you but also if you're just generally interested in looking at goa's biodiversity in terms of its marine biodiversity this might also interest you as well and then i'm hoping that we could end the presentation with a little bit of a, a question answer session but also possibly a discussion on how you think we can also integrate seaweed into um youth enterprise because i think a lot of young people in goa are finding it really hard to get jobs or finding it really hard to live in the state and have a job doing something that they enjoy and i think there's not enough conversation around getting jobs for young people so i hope that this could be one way of incorporating um some kind of of work for young people like myself um where we can work with the environment we can also make a decent income and we can also live in goa i think that's basically the aim of for, of of my career at least is to be able to live in goa and um also run a sustainable business here and so i will just present to you um a few slides on seaweed and i guess after that if you have any questions we can open it up for a question answer session so i hope you enjoy this talk So just as an introduction I'm a marine conservationist and I've spent the last um 8 to 10 years working in this space I've worked with coral reef ecosystems um as well as recently seaweed forests as well as cetaceans which are whales and dolphins and through this whole process I came to learn about coral reefs as some of the most important ecosystems um in our along our coastline goa for example has a really beautiful reef of grand island and that's where i started doing some of my research 
And it was only when I looked at the rest of India, specifically Tamil Nadu, that I got to know about various other industries that affect uh, coral reef ecosystems. So if you look at the image on your left, um, this is the map of the Gulf of Manar National Park, which is one of India's largest protected areas, and it has a huge diversity of coral species. Um, so when I was in the region and I was looking at the reefs there, I actually got to know that it also has a huge seaweed industry. And um, like most people, I had no idea that India actually had a significant amount of seaweed and that we actually had an industry. And then when I started asking more questions, I got to know that the industry is actually quite unsustainable. So if we look at the image to the bottom right, which is a picture of a coral, and then on that you can see green color seaweed. So this is an example of how certain seaweed industries have become a little damaging to the environment because seaweed and coral compete for light. And so this is what got me very excited about seaweed in general because I saw the potential of the industry, but I also saw how it could be uh, potentially environmentally damaging. And one of the really interesting things I found when I was researching seaweed and corals in the Gulf of Manar in Tamil Nadu was that there are so many women involved in the seaweed industry. So if we take coastal Tamil Nadu, there are close to 5,000 to 7,000 women that are actively engaged in the seaweed industry. These women are from lower economic classes. They um, have very little equipment. gloves. In fact, they don't even have gloves. You can see their hands, they're just wrapped with cloth and, and rubber bands. Um, and as you can see, they have to dive in um, shallow to sometimes deep waters to harvest the seaweed, which is a very strenuous and difficult and dangerous occupation. And then when they bring the seaweed to shore, they have very basic uh, spaces in which they, have, they can um, post-process the seaweed. So it's not very hygienically post-processed. Uh, they don't have a lot of intervention for cleaning the seaweed or processing the seaweed into products. Um, and then they also have to sell their seaweed at a very low price because the market for seaweed is determined by an industry. So you're probably wondering what happens to this seaweed. And it's really fascinating, but even though a lot of us don't think we've eaten seaweed, we actually consume seaweed almost every day. So a lot of the seaweed that's produced in India is produced primarily in the Gulf of Manar area in Tamil Nadu. It's also produced in Gujarat and very little of it is also produced in Maharashtra. It's mainly hand harvested by women largely, and then it's sold to companies that make certain food and pharmaceutical products. So some of the products that can be made from seaweed are gels. An example of this is agar agar, which is also called China grass, that's actually seaweed. And so this gel is then taken and put into products such as toothpaste, face creams, ice creams, uh, certain types of alcohol, and it's used as a gelling agent where normally you wouldn't use bovine gelatin, which is um, animal-based gelatin. So instead of that, a lot of industries use seaweed-based gelatin because it's a vegetarian gel. And so if you check your toothpaste tube, the next time you, you brush your teeth, you can actually find a word called carrageenan, which is a seaweed-based gel that you have in your toothpaste. So even though we feel like we don't really, we're not really using seaweed, we actually use seaweed in a lot of our products that we use daily. And it's really important to understand where the seaweed comes from. And if Goa is to start growing seaweed, we also need to look at how we can make this industry sustainable. So just like I was saying, the main industry in India is a gel-based industry or a hydrocolloid industry. And these are the main gels. So it's carrageenan, sodium alginate, and agar agar that are extracted from seaweeds and used in a lot of food and pharmaceutical products. So the next time you're brushing your teeth or you're eating ice cream, you're actually eating or using a product that has seaweed in it. Um, so this is essentially just an overview of the Indian seaweed industry right now. But if, say for example, you are going to the beach and you want to know how to see some seaweed, there are certain characteristics that define seaweed. So to start off with, they're usually large. So if we look at the, the slide to the left, that is seaweed. So it means it's large and it looks like a plant and it's found in the oceans. That's how you know that's seaweed. Whereas if it's very small, microscopic, just, you know, a single cellular um, filamentous, it's usually not seaweed, it's called microalgae. So there's two types, there's macroalgae, which is seaweed, and there's microalgae, which is 
is not seaweed, but it's a type of algae that's found in the oceans. So usually the greeny color that we find in our oceans, especially off the coast of Goa, is because we have a lot of nutrition, but we also have a lot of micro and macro algae growing along our coast. So Goa has over 145 species of seaweed. The whole of the coastline in India has close to 800 species of seaweed, but Goa has about 145 that have been documented. Um, we have our own seaweed scientist, Dr. Maria Fonseca, who is actually uh, used to be at St. Xavier's, and she has actually written a book about all of the seaweeds that we find in Goa, and she's a great resource person. She's actually one of my mentors when it comes to uh, researching seaweed in the state. So if you look at these two photographs, the one on the right are five species of seaweed that I found in this one tide pool in Baga. And I think a lot of us, when we think of Baga, we think there's nothing there but tourists. But actually, there's a lot of biodiversity. There's a lot of seaweed there. There's a lot of marine life along our coastlines. So if you do want to see seaweed, ideally, you want to go to the, the tide pools or the rock pools, which is where usually there are rocks. You want to go at low tide, which is when the sea is exposed, the, the, the tide pools are exposed. And seaweed season is usually from November to about April. That's when you see the highest diversity of seaweed. So another way to distinguish is that usually seaweed species that are found in warmer waters, like in Goa, are smaller, but are more diverse. Whereas the image we see on the left, these are seaweed species found in countries like Scotland, the United Kingdom, Australia, the, the United States. These are in waters that are much colder, and so they tend to grow much larger, and their fronds tend to be much bigger. But they're usually quite similar in terms of taste um, and in terms of function. Um, in terms of farming, if anyone is interested in looking at seaweed from a biological lens, seaweed has two forms of reproduction. And it's really important to understand this if you want to be a seaweed farmer or you want to uh, know about how to perhaps start a seaweed and mussel farm or something of the sort. Um, so there's asexual reproduction where you can just cut sections of the seaweed and then you can grow it again in the ocean. And the most amazing thing about seaweed is that it doesn't require any land, any fertilizer, or any water to grow, which makes it one of the most climate smart plants, to, uh, algae to grow right now, because you, all you need is just open ocean and sunlight. And that's something that we have a lot of in Goa, which is why the seaweed grows so well. So in terms of farming, if you're interested, it's sort of important to look at the biology of seaweed and understand it better. And then once that's done, you can understand what kind of seaweed you want to grow and how you'd like to grow it. Just to give you an example of what it would look like when you actually go out to, to see some seaweed, this is some seaweed that I photographed when I was underwater, um, but it's also exposed um, at low tide. So this species is called sargassum, and it's very commonly found in Goa, and it's found along most of our tide pools. Um, so this is just an one example then we have another species just a second this one is called spatoglossum it's a it's a thicker um broader species of seaweed and we also have this very commonly along the coast in goa I'm not sure why this is not going properly well. mm -hmm. i think the video has frozen sorry about that Let's go to the next one. Um, and this, this is another species called Dictyota, which is another very commonly found species along the coast. And these are found within a couple of meters from the surface. So not very deep and usually found where you also find oysters and mussels um, along the same tide pools. I'm going to just see if the previous one plays again because it's quite a nice one. Hopefully, it plays. Yes, okay. So, this is another seaweed species called Spatoglossum, and it actually tastes really nice. It's like raw mango, which is quite amazing. Um, and we also have this very commonly, but in the deeper stretches of uh, the coastline. So, if any of you are uh, go out fish you might actually catch some of this in your fishing line right so that was the basics about seaweed biology and the seaweed industry 
um, if you were to look at the seaweed market, so if say, for example, Goa was really interested in investing in seaweed and wanting to grow seaweed farms, then you kind of have to look at where the Indian market is because Goa is too small a state to rely on just one market. And so the global seaweed industry is over $12 billion and it's growing substantially. This usually is seaweed in terms of beauty products and seaweed in terms of food. These are the main markets that are growing. For example, Korea, Japan, China are huge when it comes to seaweed. They put seaweed in a lot of their beauty products, a lot of their food products. And uh, this trend is slowly moving to the US and it's also moving to Europe. And a lot of people are becoming very health conscious. And so they're really, really interested in seaweed because it's really nutritious. If we look at India, there's a growing seaweed market in terms of the beauty industry as well as the organic food market. And there are lots of people also interested in using seaweed as a biofertilizer. I think this is one of the most common uses from the past. So if I talk to my grandmom about this, or I talk to people from her generation, seaweed was actually used as fertilizers um, in terms of like for nutrition for coconut trees, but other plants as well. So it's basically very, very nutritious as a fertilizer, but also very nutritious as a food source, as well as a, a beauty product. And so if we look at Goa being um, a state that really does invest in seaweed, there is actually a huge market for people to start investing in. And so then if we are interested, we have to start with farming. Um, farming seaweed is much like farming on land, except that it, it requires a whole set of skills, but essentially it's the same where you put out spores or seeds of seaweed and it grows on rafts. And after a period of about six months, it's ready to harvest. And then this harvested seaweed is dried, like you see in this image, and then sent to various industries to be put into food products or beauty products or um, in the hydrocolloid industry. So Goa has the potential, given its 100 kilometer coastline, to invest in seaweed production. We currently don't have any, um, any policy that, that surrounds it, so it's difficult in that sense to start it. For example, if any one of us wanted to start a seaweed farm right now, it would be very hard because there's no paperwork, um, there's no documentation of who to contact, um, there's no understanding of where along the coast you're allowed to grow seaweed. So there's a lot of uh, a gap in terms of the policy that needs to be uh, closed and the government really does need to work on this, the fisheries department as well as the forest department. It would do well if they worked on some kind of a base policy for seaweed because it's really important to do it in a sustainable manner before industry comes in and, and does it in a very large scale damaging way. Um, other parts of the world have seaweed farming and what they do is they have some kind of guideline that allows them to grow seaweed in a proper way. So just like you would have guidelines for growing certain types of mushrooms or certain types of other rare food, you also have guidelines for seaweed to make sure that people don't over harvest it and we don't damage our natural seaweed forests. Um, one example of how we can actually have seaweed in Goa grown very sustainably is to grow it in an integrated way. So a really amazing thing is that seaweed and mussels, so just our shinanyo, they grow around the same time of the year. So they grow around November to about April, um, both seaweeds and mussels. And this is a great integrated way of farming because now you have two different products. So if you are someone from the fishing community that wants to already grows mussels and wants to grow seaweed, it's quite easy to integrate these two. The only determining factors are salinity and location. Um, and seaweed can also be grown in combination with things like fish farms and shrimp farms. So like you can see in this image, there's a fish farm which is right in the center. And a lot of the, the nutrition that comes out in, in the form of sh uh, fish or shrimp excreta is nitrogen and phosphorus. And so when this falls into the ocean, it normally pollutes a lot of the ocean. So seaweeds can actually be grown in addition to this. So if you grow seaweeds along with fish farms or shrimp farms, the seaweed actually absorbs a lot of the pollutants and that helps it grow. So in our minds, it's pollution, but actually for seaweed, it's nutrition. So it's, it's really good to have an integrated system where coastal communities can grow seaweed along with fish, along with mussels, so that it not only mimics natural environments like it is in the ocean, it's also more sustainable, but it's also more climate smart. So for example, if there is some kind of a disease and 
you know the muscle population is affected then you still have seaweed that you can sell or vice versa so it's good to also encourage forms of aquaculture that are integrated so that when a fishing community is financially rely reliant on this they are not reliant on just one species they actually have multiple products that they can sell as well um, and so this is essentially one example of how goa can very progressively move towards sustainable aquaculture unlike most parts of the country where it's very intensive it's very monoculture where you just have one species of shrimp or you have one species of fish goa really has the potential to have a more integrated approach to farming and it would be really exciting to actually work with uh, the fisheries department and the forest department in goa to come up with some kind of policy where we can have an integrated approach to growing things because a lot of us realize how important um our seafood is to us it's so important for our culture it's so important for our tourism and we're realizing now that we're losing a lot of our fish species we're losing a lot of our mussels and it's time to really rethink how we um use the oceans and sort of design businesses that are more regenerative so seaweed is actually very regenerative because you not only um produce more fish because it acts as a breeding ground for marine life but it also just allows you to have a business that captures a lot of carbon um and is is therefore very climate smart in that sense so it seems like a very um sensible way to move forward in terms of building coastal aquaculture so if i were to end this very short presentation on my hopes for the future in terms of goa investing in seaweed um or in india in general there would be three main points the first being that we really need to work very closely with coastal communities i think a lot of businesses start up having this intention of helping communities but it doesn't follow through because you don't have a lot of conversation with communities so i think to start off with if the seaweed industry is to take off in india in goa we need to have close consultation with coastal communities to understand how they feel about this understand whether they are interested in in investing in this or being a part of this and then also look at areas that they use so the commons that are used by fishing communities to see if they're all right with rafts being blown and and seaweed being blown in those regions because they might also be used for other forms of fisheries um so that's one the second point is that we really need to look at commons <coughs> and guide So what this means is that we need to make sure that wherever we harvest our seaweed from, we make sure that the water is clean and that the seaweed is harvested in a sustainable manner using guidelines. So making sure that not just everyone can access the seaweed forest, that you actually have to have, say, maybe some kind of a, a permit for you to harvest seaweed, like it's done in other parts of the world, and also that we do regular tests on the water quality because Goa actually has. very bad water quality we have a lot of e coli we have a lot of pollutants coming in because we don't manage our sewage very well so it's really important that if we are going to invest in an industry like seaweed and and look at at boosting you know food based seaweed products we really need to look at the cleanliness of our inshore waters um and make sure that we make more of an effort to clean and then the third point like i mentioned before is a huge gap in policy so right now there there aren't any guidelines there's um no law that prohibits anyone from over extracting seaweed which is quite dangerous and so we need to really sit together with the government with think tanks um with people from the fishing community and co-design a kind of seaweed policy for goa that could actually be replicated in other parts of india and so with that i will just say that i'm really excited to be a part of this it's a very slow process because it's not being done in goa yet and it's only been recently seaweed farming is recently catching up in other parts of india but i think that if we learn from other countries we learn from other parts of southeast asia we can also tie into what they've done and kind of learn how to do it ourselves and there's huge potential for young people interested in the oceans uh, to get on board with this and start small seaweed farms seaweed and mussel farms that can not only supply the local market but can also be a good product in terms of um, the overall country which is getting increasingly interested in in um nutritious food products such as seaweed spirulina um and other forms of superfood so i will end my presentation here and then if you have any questions we can take that forward
Gabriela, the questions are in the chat box. Uh, would okay. you like to address them directly or would you like to have a discussion or would you like to read them or how? Yeah, I can definitely take these questions up. Uh, so Flory has asked uh, if all seaweeds are of economic value or just some of, or some of them are nuisance. Uh, yes, I did make dog treats out of seaweed. So right now we have about 145 species of seaweed. While they may not all have an economic um, value, they all have an intrinsic ecological value, which means that every one of them are important for some form or the other in our coastlines. So it's really important to protect a lot of our seaweed forests. Um, but if we look at the economic value, the main seaweed species are sargassum, gracilaria, and ulva. So these are the main seaweed species that you would possibly use to either eat or um, they would be used in cosmetic products as well. I hope that answers your question. In terms of the dog treats, I just tried it as, as an example of how it's possible to make seaweed products, but um, the pet food market is quite competitive. And so it works out too expensive, but the better market to actually invest in is more food-based or uh, nutraceuticals or superfoods and, and beauty products. Um, so Gaurav has asked a very good question. In the absence of any state policy or guidelines for seaweed farming, what is the way to start? Um, both, I think we can both create awareness, which is what I'm also trying to do, but also definitely have a conversation first with fishing communities and also with the, the fisheries department as possibly also with the, the forest department because they will, there's also some kind of conflict in terms of having to protect seaweed forests as well. So you want to make sure that there's some kind of a co-design for a CV policy. How this comes about, I'm not really sure, but I guess it would start by possibly having some kind of a draft policy that is, has been used in other countries that can also be looked at, but more locally looked at in terms of Goa. Um, what are the products prepared from seaweed? Uh, right now, you can make food products from them. Seaweed is highly nutritious. It has over 30 different minerals and, and vitamins in them. So for example, some species of seaweed have vitamin A, C, B12, very high in iodine, um, calcium, more calcium in seaweed than there is in milk, more vitamin C in seaweed than there are in oranges. Very nutritious products, but food products can be made from seaweed. And also in terms of looking at India, um, and products for the Indian market is a lot of women in India are iodine deficient and a lot of them have thyroid problems, some of which are because of iodine deficiency. And seaweed is one of the most nutritious products when it comes to iodine. So just two teaspoons of seaweed a day will give you your daily iodine requirement. Usually, it depends on which species. And so there's huge potential to create superfoods from seaweed. And that's a high value market, which means that we can harvest very little seaweed and make a lot of high value products from it that are beneficial um, to especially women. Um, that's a good question. So Lutz has a question about land-based aquaculture. So she said land-based aquaculture is growing mainly with tilapia. Can seaweed be integrated with this? Um, ideally not because seaweed requires salt water and tilapia, even though it, it does survive in estuaries, it's a mainly freshwater fish. Tilapia is also invasive, so we don't really want to encourage it. Um, it's not from, it's not native to Goa, and it actually is destroying a lot of our local fish species. So ideally, you don't really want to encourage tilapia farming. But seaweed can be very easily integrated with mussels um, because mussels usually require very similar salinity, and they also grow around the same time. So the ideal combination would be a seaweed and mussel farm which you can grow from November to April and have a couple of months and then harvest it um, after that. And mussels are also very good in terms of um, the market because they have a good price in the market. Um, Marianne has asked seaweeds as, as fertilizer. It's also used as cosmetics. Um, as fertilizer, has it to be composted and then used? Um, that's a good question. So right now, the, the few times that I've used it, I've just washed it to remove excess salt and then just made it into like blitzed it. So you just have like a liquid fertilizer and then put it in the plants. Um, however, there was a scientist at the NIO, Dr. Undavule, who unfortunately has passed away, but 
he had specifically specifically designed a seaweed fertilizer. I remember I went to his house for a meeting and he poured me this glass and kept it on the table and I was almost going to drink it because I thought it was some exotic like juice that he had made, but it was actually seaweed fertilizer. So he was the expert for that. Unfortunately, I don't have the exact recipe that he used. Um, I'm not sure if there's any scientists still working on it, but it's worth uh, checking in as well with the NIO. But as of now, you don't have to compost it. You can just blitz it in your mixer, make it into a liquid and then put it in your plants or put it into your soil. And it's really, it's really good for your soil. Um, and then uh, Frederick has also asked about my own story. So I got interested in it because I was working with coral reefs and I looked at how seaweed in the seaweed industry was actually quite damaging to reefs. And then I worked at a seaweed um, food company in Scotland. So I lived there for a bit and I worked with Mara Seaweed, which is a food company there. And they make seaweed seasonings. So it's sort of like in case, instead of using, um, you know, chili flakes and oregano on your pizza, you'd, instead you'd use seaweed seasonings or like seaweed, put seaweed in your ramen or noodles or eggs on toast. And instead of just having it for flavor, you also have it for nutrition. So it acts as a great uh, nutrition supplement, um, but it's also a lot more tasty to eat as well. And so that's how I got interested. And for me right now, I'm really interested in it because I see the huge potential for Goa, but also for other parts of India to grow seaweed, but also um, look at mapping a lot of our seaweed forests. So for example, in the, the CZMP maps right now, the coastal zone management plan maps that are being currently reviewed by people in the state, there's no mention of seaweed forest or seagrass forest, even though these are very important ecosystems for our fisheries, because a lot of the local fish that we eat, they breed around seaweed forests. And so in a similar way, I'm not only interested in, in creating some kind of products from seaweed, but more importantly, and more urgently looking at mapping a lot of Goa seaweed forests so that we at least know how much we have, where we have these, and then we can work towards protecting them and managing them in a, a sustainable way. Because our that because they're very very important for our coastal ecosystems so i think i'm that's sort of where i'm more interested in um ashley has said yes china grass is seaweed um no it's not the dried up airbags from fish <laughs> it's seaweed based gel and it's also completely vegetarian and vegan um gaurav has asked which government agency is offering training for seaweed farming so as of now, there's an organization based in Kerala um, and Tamil Nadu, which do seaweed farming, but they mainly focus on an invasive species of seaweed. So I'm not very keen on that. But if you're interested in native seaweed species, I'm very happy to connect you to a scientist who's working on it. And I'm also looking at starting a pilot seaweed farm by the end of the year. Um, so there'll probably be more updates about that. Um, Kevin has asked, are there any varieties of seaweed that are directly edible? Seaweed burgers and are there any traditional dishes made with seaweed? That's a great question. So right now we, as far as I know, there are no traditional recipes in Goa based with, on seaweed. But if anybody knows, please let me know because I'm very curious to know about this. Tamil Nadu does have seaweed incorporated in its cuisine. It's mainly extracted like a gel and they make some kind of a halva with it. Um, and they use it in their desserts. And sometimes they put it into like a vegetable dish. So they incorporate it into their food, but very rarely. And I think it's because seaweed has a very fishy flavor. And so a lot of people find it difficult to incorporate it into food that may not taste fishy. But Goan cuisine would go really well with seaweed. So for example, you could have a really interesting fish thali and you could add a lot of seaweed to your average fish thali and it would just make it a lot more nutritious. Um, in terms of seaweed burgers, there's a really great company in uh, California. Um, they're called Aqua, and they currently make seaweed kelp burgers. And they've got huge funding, actually, to make vegan burgers out of seaweed. And they're doing really well. But again, the challenge with the Indian market is that seaweed tastes fishy. And so some people that are vegetarian may feel like they're eating fish, even though they're, even though fish actually taste like seaweed. 
the fishy flavor that you get is actually seaweed because fish feed on seaweed. It's the base. It's like cows feeding on grass. So in that sense, um, it's just sort of a disassociation that has to happen uh, in terms of the flavor. But seaweed flavors are really amazing. It's really high in umami, which is the fifth flavor. And it really helps create a really nice, dense, um, meaty kind of flavor, even though it's completely vegetarian. Um, Clyde has asked if we need to clean waters to start seaweed farms. So actually, when I harvest seaweed, which is very little bit, I started harvesting around Bhagatar and Anjuna. And when I did some tests, I realized that the water there is actually very polluted. And so I stopped. But the northern and southernmost beaches and coastlines in Goa are much cleaner. But I don't know how long it will stay that clean. So absolutely, we definitely need to clean our water. And we definitely need to look at better sewage treatment plants for Goa. Because regardless of whether we have seaweed farms or not, um, we eat fish out of the, the oceans. We swim in the oceans. We have tourism based on our coastline. So it's very, very important that we work harder at keeping our coastal waters clean. Um, and how do we start this? Yeah, there are currently no checks to say how we dispose of water. So I guess one way to do it would be to pressurize your local panchayat if you live in a coastal area, to ask them how they dispose their waste, make sure that there are sewage treatment plants around. I'm not an expert on this, and I'm sure there are other people that will advise you better. but. I would definitely say that encouraging a local panchayat and um, to take this up and to make sure that we are not putting a lot of our sewage into the rivers because they eventually end up in the sea and then they eventually end up in the fish that you eat. So it's logical to actually not pollute our, our waters. Um, Lutz has asked another really interesting question. We can grow seaweed in the river mouths, but it has to be close enough to the sea that the salinity is high. So, for example, in the river mouth of Zuali and Mamandovi, there are quite a lot of seaweed. In fact, Donapola, um, the sort of where you have the Donapola jetty, there's tons and tons of seaweed growing because you not only have the nutrition that comes down from the river, but you also have the salt water from the sea. So it creates an optimum environment to grow seaweed. But the only problem is when you grow seaweed in a river mouth, there's lots of pollution in the river. So you won't be able to use that seaweed for food but you could possibly use it for fertilizer or something that doesn't require um, extremely clear water. But ideally, you want to grow seaweed sort of further out where there's not river water coming out into the sea. Um, Yvette has asked a question. We have, a, we have a lot of mangroves along the coastline. Will this affect seaweed? So mangrove, again, grows mainly in estuarine waters, which is a mix of fresh and salt water, which is not the same place that seaweed grows. So no, mangroves and seaweed will not compete. Seaweed will grow much more towards a more saline part of the ocean. So closer out at sea or around the river mouth area, which is usually where you don't have too much mangroves anyway. Uh, Simon has asked how far from the shore and how deep in the sea are seaweeds grown? So usually in the intertidal, which means that it's the region between the high tide and the low tide, which is why when you go to a rocky area and if you go there at low tide, you'll be able to see a lot of the seaweed because they are exposed. And then at high tide, they go underwater. And so they're grown quite shallow. So probably around a maximum depth of like five to six meters. Um, so relatively shallow inshore waters is where you'll find it. And you can grow seaweed out further out at sea, but it's usually advisable to grow it within a couple of hundred meters from the coast so that you can also you know, take a boat and manage it. And it's not too far out where it gets very expensive to go out by boat to constantly manage it. Um, seaweed soup is excellent. And so is sushi. I agree. Can kelp noodles be made in Goa? So kelp, like I showed you a picture earlier, is a really long, big seaweed species. It doesn't grow in Goa. It grows in cold waters. Um, but a similar species called saragatsum, which is in my first video, it's a brown color seaweed that can easily be made into any kind of food product. Um, I actually tried making seaweed noodles, uh, seaweed spaghetti ones. So you basically just like you make normal pasta, but you just infuse it with seaweed and it tasted really nice. But again, it's not just the, about the idea of making it, that it actually, there's a lot involved with building a product from seaweed because the market is still is still growing. So you ideally want to create a product that is very easy to get into the market. Um, uh, 
wood harvesting seaweed harm other aquatic plants? That's a really good question. Right now, if you grow native seaweed where it's already growing, it shouldn't be a problem. But like I was saying in the presentation, it's good to grow different types of seaweed together. So just like on land, if you grow uh, different species of plants together, the farm is more biodiverse and it's also more resilient. In a similar way, if you just grow one species of seaweed, it might get damaged with pests, but it also might create a monoculture and um, it's not very healthy for the ocean. So if you're growing seaweed, it's better to grow it like it grows in the ocean, which is multiple species. Um, thanks, Colleen. <laughs> and Gaurav has asked another question, which is, could we encourage the State Department to come up with a seaweed policy based on the fact that it can be used as a bioremediant for pollution? That's really, that's a great idea. Yes, we can use it as a bioremediant. Um, it can be used to suck up a lot of the nutrient pollution that we have in the water. In fact, I think the NIO did a study once where they wanted to grow mussels and they put rafts out to grow mussels. And the mussel rafts got so heavy because there was so much seaweed growing on them that they actually snapped. And so there's lots of potential to design rafts properly where you can grow seaweed just to remove the nutrients out of. But the worry is that if you take all of that seaweed out of the ecosystem, you might also be damaging, you might also be removing certain ecosystems for fish to breathe in. So the logical way to do it would be to grow enough and then sort of let the seaweed float in the ocean and sink down so that a lot of the nutrition is stored in the ocean itself, but at least it's taken away from coastal waters. Or the alternative is to grow it like a bioremediant and then remove it and maybe use it as a fertilizer of some sort. But um, that's definitely possible. But again, we'd have to look at policies that allows for it so that not just anyone is growing it and taking it out of the ocean. Um, yes, so Simon has asked, is there any way to cultivate seaweed? There is, and right now it's not being done in Goa, but I'm working with a seaweed scientist right now, and hopefully by the end of the year, I'll have a pilot seaweed raft ready that we could test for six months to see how well it goes. Um, and Selma has asked the question, does the seaweed have any toxins present? Um, so right now, most of the seaweed species that we have in Goa, that's 145, most of them are edible, some are not, but um, there are certain that need to be further studied. So the ones that I harvest and the ones, the 10 species that I generally harvest are completely toxin free um, in the sense that they have no, nothing that can affect you when you eat them. But the only concern is that they might have certain pollutants on them. So if the water is not clean, then the seaweed will also not be clean. So it's really important to harvest seaweed from clean waters and to do um, a water test to make sure that you're not harvesting seaweed that could have some kind of heavy metals or some kind of other E. coli, which is possible. It's not, heavy metals are very rare, um, but more likely you'll have some kind of E. coli contamination with seaweed. And um, that's the most important thing to look at. Um, Flory has asked a question, do pathogens forming bi form biofilms on seaweeds? Um, that's a good question. So right now, I'm not sure. What I do know is that if it's a, an E. coli or any kind of um, external bacteria, it doesn't get into the seaweed. So if you clean it and you wash it properly, then your seaweed should be fine. But about a biofilm, I'm not really sure. I need to get back to you about that. And uh, Sabina has asked, which seaweed do I intend growing? So the most commonly available seaweed species right now is sargassum, which is the kelp equivalent. Um, it's also called hijiki in Japanese. And it's a very commonly used seaweed species in Japanese cuisine. But in Goa, somehow we have it growing in like tons of it, but we don't, we haven't eaten it yet. So that's one of the seaweed species I'm planning on growing, mainly because it's very easily available and so even if it's harvested to quite a large degree, it won't damage the local ecosystem. Whereas other seaweed species like nori and ulva do grow in Goa, but they grow in very small quantities. So you don't, you should not harvest them at all because you will over harvest it for sure. Um, Jolenta has asked, what will be the cost of starting a seaweed farm and can you export seaweed? Um, these are great questions. Right now, I don't have the answers. I will be piloting a seaweed farm to understand how expensive it is. 
But if we look at rural Tamil Nadu, they've equated, um, it, it costs around, I think, 15,000 to 20,000 to build one raft. And that's mainly because they've incorporated everything in terms of setting the raft up, putting a mooring buoy, um, having a boat to manage it, things like that. But for Goa, it hasn't been estimated yet, but I'm hoping to know that soon. And you can export seaweed, but the Indian market is, is big enough to try a new product. And it's probably better to create food products for the Indian market because if the European market already has seaweed from Europe, the, the American market already has seaweed from America. And every country basically, because it has its coastline, has its own seaweed species. So it makes more sense to work within the Indian market than to export. Um, Joe has asked, can seaweed be cultivated in land as part of RES aquaculture? That's a really good question. So one thing I didn't talk about was how we could integrate seaweed with shrimp farms. And a lot of shrimp farms in Goa are very close to the sea. And so you can use something called RES technology where uh, you circulate a lot of the water from the shrimp farms and use it to grow seaweed. Because just like in a fish farm, a lot of the shrimp produces nitrates and phosphates from shrimp excreta, and that can be used to grow seaweed. But the only limitation to this is you have to have a, a shrimp farm or a prawn farm that's right next to the sea um, because it needs saline water. So a lot of the farms in Divar or Shorao or further inland will not be suitable for seaweed farming because the, saline, the salinity or the salt in the water is not high enough for seaweed. But if you have a shrimp farm closer to the sea, then it's very possible to grow seaweed along with shrimp in a land-based system. Yeah. And I think that's it. Savio has asked if there's a market scope for seaweed cultivation. So right now the main market is the gels. So agar agar, china grass, that's one market, but it's a very low value market. So you get very little for your seaweed. Ideally, you want to also create a high value market by making products, a food, food and pharmaceutical or um, beauty products from seaweed that have a higher share in the market. Uh, what PPT of salinity is needed for seaweed cultivation? So ideally above 28 to 30 PPT is what would be required. But again, it depends from seaweed species to species. Um, but ideally you want in Goa, if you have a seaweed species that grows in the coastal water, you want to grow it in the same area. And you don't necessarily want to grow it inland because then it might become invasive if you grow it in a place where it's not already grown before. Um, yeah, I think that's a lot of questions. <laughs> I think I've come to the end of the questions. Um, I hope that was helpful and interesting. And I think Dr. Maria Fonseca is on the talk as well, which is so nice. <laughs> um, and she should ideally be giving this talk because she's actually Goa's seaweed queen. Yes. <laughs> she has a great book, which she's written about all of uh, a large number of seaweed species in Goa, but I'm trying to get her to publish the book more widely, but it hasn't happened yet. So hopefully in another couple of months, maybe we can talk to Frederick about this, about publishing um, a second edition of a seaweed guidebook for Goa. That would be great. Um, thank you very much, uh, Frederick, over to you, or if anyone else has more questions, I'm also happy to answer. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Gabriela. Thank you so much. Uh, not only your knowledge, but also uh, your attitude and the fact that young people are so concerned about such issues gives us a lot of hope. And you know, it's something very positive for all of us. We are very grateful in this short time, you answered the question so well.